here I am again, Morris Lupton off for my morning walk. This must be the finest stretch of beach on the finest island the whole world over. For a little speck of land in the North Atlantic, it sure is a good un. Oh, I see those yoga folks up at the lighthouse are up bright and early, saluting the sun and all that. <laughs> I always thought that looked like fun. Ah, but this walk isn't the same without Sparky. <laughs> she did love chasing that tennis ball. <laughs> oh, Sparky, I miss you, girl. Hmm, the crate has definitely been smoking more than usual lately. That's funny, that, for a dormant volcano. Shelmiston used to be a quiet place. You'd only come here if you liked fishing or bird watching. But since the new ferry service started, we get loads of tourists. Ah, but what you gonna do? It's always changing. Yep, Shelmiston's a smashing place. I'm lucky to call it home. Ah, <laughs> the bench. <laughs> yeah, this is, uh, well, it, it's my bench. Yeah, the museum paid for it because I was the, uh, the curator there. Yeah, and they did that to remember me because, uh, oh, yes, I am dead. It's been some adjustment, but not all bad. Hmm. Yeah, I, I should probably go and check on the museum, actually. Yeah, I've been collecting the stories of Shelmiston for years now, here in my museum. There are so many stories, and wonderful ones. The museum started off small, but just grew and grew. <laughs> it's shut at the moment, of course. Not sure what's going to happen with it now that I'm well, no longer doing it. I do like coming back here, though. Gives me a bit of purpose, which I've really missed since, you know, becoming dead. Oh, one thing that's been keeping me amused since I've been dead, I've found I can do some well, new things. <laughs> Pretty weird. Yeah, I'm not sure what use it is, but it's been keeping me quite entertained. Ah, but the novelty's worn off. I mean, it's been, well, I don't know how long exactly, but an awful long time since I've had anyone to talk to. Well, anyone who talked back, anyway. Sounds like Sparky. Is that you? Morris, come with me. I need to show you something. He? Morris, you worked it out. I... you can talk? Well, I could always talk. You just couldn't understand me. And, and you can hear me? Well, sure. You are talking, aren't you? Oh, Sparky! What is it, Morris? It's been so long. 
I never... I thought I'd had my last conversation. Oh, I'm so very glad. <laughs> I'm glad too, Morris. I've been waiting for you. We need to go... Wait. Are you really my Sparky? M my Sparky girl? Mostly. The best bits. But listen, I don't know how long before the volcano erupts, but it's not long now. The volcano? E erupting? But it's, but it's dormant. No, no, no. It has been dormant because of the custodian. But the custodian is weakening and we don't know how much longer they can hold on. The custodian? What are you talking about? Shelmiston is volcanic. It's supposed to erupt every once in a while. The only reason it hasn't is the custodian keeping the island calm. Custodian keeping the island calm? Take your time, Morris. Dogs are better at understanding this kind of stuff than humans. The custodian is a ghost. Yes, now you're getting it. The custodian is a ghost who appeases the island, keeps it safe to live on. But the current custodian has been doing the job a long time and really needs to retire. Well, and the island needs a new custodian. That's right. It's up to us to find a new one. There are five prospects that I know of. Five ghosts still hanging around the island who haven't gone into the west yet. We need to find them and see if they'll take the job. Well, what if none of the prospects wants it? Oh. If the current custodian fades away and there's nobody to commune with the island spirit, well... Oh, well, that would be bad. Bad how, Sparky? Volcano bad. You've seen how it's smoking. We don't have long now. Well, could I be the custodian? Oh, I wish. But Ghost Code 342B dictates that the custodian must be a ghost who has been dead on this island for at least a thousand days. And we don't have that long. Ghost Code 342B. Yeah, well, I suppose that makes as much sense as anything else. Right. Let's get going, Morris. Our first prospect is Peter Noach. Oh, yeah, from the yoga centre. Yeah, he died a few years ago, didn't he? Yeah, I remember his funeral on the lighthouse. Yes, yes, that's the fella. He always had those funny green treats. Let's go pay him a visit. Wow, oh, flying. Oh, this feels nice. <laughs> what? Uh, oh, right. Oh, <laughs> you kind of forget about it after a while. Oh, well, you always was impressed with this yoga center. Pete seemed like a chap who went through some tough times, and creating this place really seemed to help him. Yep, and it's still going strong. They're always busy with folks from the mainland. Uh, yoga center run by a robot. <laughs> How things change. <laughs> well, it seems to be working out, though. So, now Pete's a ghost. So how do we find him? Well, remember that clue I sent you from inside my urn? The tag? Um, yeah. Right. So that was something special to me while I was alive that helped me channel my ghost. A kind of memento. So we need to channel the ghost of Peter Noach. And to do that, we need to find his mementos. And how are we going to do that? By looking into the memories of those who loved him best. People with memories of Pete will have little thought bubbles coming out of their heads. Those are a sign you'll be able to dive into that person's memory. I suppose that's hardly the strangest thing I've heard today. Oh, Morris, just you wait. Now, to recap. Find people who are close to Peter. View their memories. Track down the mementos. And then leave the rest to me. So people, then memories, then mementos, then Pete. Yeah, think I get the idea. Okay, let's go.
When Pete arrived at the lighthouse, he needed help running it, but refused all offers. Eventually, fearing the possibility of a shipwreck, Trinity House sent me to Shelmerston to help keep things running smoothly. I bought Pete a plant as a welcome present. He introduced himself very quietly, but didn't seem to want to say anything else. He seemed distracted, like gravity was pressing down on him harder than other people. Whenever I would enter a room, Pete would mutter some excuse to leave. I didn't have a single conversation with anyone in months. Eventually, Pete noticed the plant. Then, Pete noticed me. That was the start of what became this plant room. We spent hours in here over the years, sowing seeds and tending our plants together. Wow. Robots got complicated, didn't they? <laughs> yeah, I didn't realize how important M was to Pete. Dogs hate all fruit. I'm not going near this, Morris. Okay, let's find some more memories. I met Pete for the first time on a yoga retreat in Goa. He was the best yoga teacher, but very reserved. I noticed he had some army tattoos. I wanted to ask about them, but he would never talk about himself. When I got home, I looked him up. I couldn't believe it. He'd been with special forces in Helmand and was awarded a medal for bravery. Pete's unit had been in an ambush. He tried to save a colleague whose leg had been blown off, but by the time they'd reached base, it was too late. Pete was the only survivor. I booked the retreat again the next year. I thought he was such an interesting bloke, still waters, you know. And one evening, after class, I sort of, I followed him down to the beach. I saw him throw something into the water and went to have a look, picked it out of the shallows before it was washed away. It was his medal. I picked it up. I went back to go the following year, but Pete wasn't teaching and it just wasn't the same, not as good. Then, a couple of years later, I saw an online ad for his new retreat in a lighthouse. And I booked immediately. I took the medal with me. Perhaps he would want it back. It was the same Pete Noach. And if anything, he was an even better teacher. One coffee break, when I got him on his own, I brought up Helmand in conversation. I wish I hadn't. It was like a shutter coming down. I, I didn't mention the medal. I kept coming back for the yoga, and you know, over the years I saw Pete Mello. I think the lighthouse was doing him good. He even cracked a joke with the group once in a while. So, that summer, the one before he died, I decided to act. It was the day I was leaving and I showed him his medal. There was a moment of total surprise. I was worried then. But he took it. He turned it over in his hand. The poor guy was lost for words. He gave me a nod of thanks and slipped it into his pocket. I'm glad he got it back. Oh, Pete. Oh, you had no idea.
This is a conspicuous gallantry cross. They don't give those to just anybody. I was getting ready to lay my egg. But my nest needed that little something extra. I found the perfect thing. The human and that metal beast seemed quite agitated at their loss. I always hated those blooming things. Dogs are actually very good at solving these. They're just hard for us to turn. Hey, I'm starting to pick up the scent of something else here. I think it's Grenkins. Grenkins? Yeah, they're tiny spirits, distant relations of the island spirit. Apparently they bring good luck. When we get close to one, I'll pop up and let you know. Okay, Sparky. Okay, we're in the right place. But now we need to slice and rotate this object to just the right spot to get the Grenken out. Renkin, good to see you. Morris, these spirits have been on Shelmerston for thousands of years, and they bring good luck. We should definitely keep finding them. Ha, 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 ha. 
I just got divorced and really wanted to go on a golfing holiday, but my best mate Tammy somehow taught me into doing a yoga retreat instead. Yoga made me feel weird and uncomfortable. After the first day, I'd basically given up. I thought Pete was a bit angry with me. It was hard to tell. Exploring the lighthouse, I came across Pete's set of clubs. Bingo, I thought. I wondered where I could practice my drive. I took the clubs up to the observation deck and spent all afternoon perfecting my stroke. The sun was shining. It was the best time I'd had all week. Suddenly, I was aware of Pete watching me. My heart sank and I braced myself for a telling off. How wrong I was. Pete cracked a smile and joined in. Every evening for the rest of that week, we were up on that observation deck driving balls into the sea. Best holiday in years. I even got into yoga by the end. <laughs> I guess old Pete had a light side after all. How many golf balls are in the sea around this lighthouse? Pete was hard to read, you know? Strong, silent type. But you could tell he loved his collection of Buddhas. He said they were like fat little soldiers that kept him safe. To be honest, I thought that was a bit odd. Pete was very protective about his collection. Hated people messing with them, even telling off M when she was dusting them. One day, one of the Buddhas went missing. Pete was distraught. Not much affected him, so it was a shock for everyone to see how upset he was. All of us at the retreat spent the whole afternoon searching, but we never found it. To cheer him up, 
Em bought Pete a little toy robot. You could tell Pete was delighted. Ah, what a lovely gesture. She was a good friend, that Em. What a nice little fella. I'm glad we found him. Okay, that's all of the mementos. Now what do we have to do? Wow, I'm getting a really strong scent. Well done. I should easily be able to sniff out Peter's spirit now. All right then. Uh, what do you need me to do? Absolutely nothing. Just let me do my thing. There's many things in the world you haven't seen, Morris. What are those things, eh? Yep. I mean, yep. Those are all of Pete's fragments. I just need to round them up. Well, go get them, girl. Really, you? But well, it's me, Morris. Uh, Morris Lupton. <laughs> of course, I remember you, Morris. It's lovely to see you. How's death treating you? Oh, well, you know, it's a bit jarring, but... Well, I'm having a nice enough time. But listen, Pete, we've come to ask you something. Do you know about the custodian? The custodian? The, the person who communes with the island, yes? I've noticed the volcano looks like it's waking up. Yes, well, that's the thing. We need a new one. Oh, me? To be the custodian? Oh, Morris, I I'm flattered, but I don't think I'm the one for this job. I spent my whole life and my whole afterlife trying to find peace. And lately, I think I've found it. I'm satisfied with how things turned out. I'm finally ready to go into the West. I don't want to stay around any longer. Ah, well, um, well, fair enough. Would you want to come with me? I, I would be grateful for the company. Well, that, that's kind of you, but... I... I do really need to help find a new custodian. Maybe afterwards. 
I understand. Well, best of luck with the search then. I'm sure you'll find someone perfect for it. Hmm. Well, that didn't go well. Oh, no worries, Morris. Plenty of other prospects. Well, four. Hey, Pete mentioned going into the West. But what is that? Oh, well, uh... That's a very complicated question, Morris. Um, just think of it as leaving all this behind. Which is not something we can do now. We need to go find Val. They're opening the sculpture park today. Oh, is that opening already? Time certainly does move a bit quicker once you're not in the world. Talking to people, it all feels so distant. Though, if I'm being honest, I suppose I was a little buried in the museum those last few years after... Well, you know... Ha! <laughs> you know, you might say I started living like a ghost well before I became one. Oh, you weren't a ghost, Morris. That museum is full of life, and ghosts can't give belly rubs anywhere near as well as you did, trust me. Now let's get going. We're gonna find Val. Ah, yes, Val. I do feel a bit sorry for her, having her home invaded by all these silly artists. Maybe. But at least we have a laird who's interested in doing nice things for Shelmiston. Yeah, I suppose so. I was never sure about letting all those artists stay on Shelmiston, but I must admit that his heart's in the right place. Well, let's find Val then. After you, Sparky! the park has changed. I barely recognize it anymore with all these artists buzzing about. Oh, they're not so bad. So many different and exciting smells. Yes, well, you and I have always valued different things in smells. And now we need to sniff out Val. Just like before, let's find some people with memories of her and track down those mementos. I love them. I can't get enough gloves. I stole the farmer's glove. I stole the fisherman's glove. I saw that girl out in my woods riding that strange bumpy beast around again. She really seemed to love that awful creature. This was an opportunity I wasn't going to miss. <laughs> Lovely gloves. I always did suspect there might be something in those rumours about camels on the island. All that time, and Val never let on. <laughs> Bless you, Val. Hey, Morris, I bet you wish you were alive so you could rub me with this glove. I'm getting the scent of Grenkins again, Morris. I'll pop up. 
After my wife Penny's death, I struggled to find ways to spend time with my daughter. It had hit us both hard, but, you know, stiff upper lip and all that. I always found it best to keep busy. Looking for something we could do together, I bought Valerie a set of paints. But she never even opened them. I was cross at first, but asked myself, what would Penny do? So I decided to let it go. Then one day I managed to talk her into coming into the park with me to paint some of the nature she loves so much. She wasn't very enthusiastic, but agreed to give it a try. It was a disaster. Valerie simply didn't have the temperament for painting. She had a huge silly tantrum and threw all the paints away. I told her I wasn't having this kind of childish behavior and I told her to stay in her room until she had calmed down. I wished Penny was still with us. She would have known what to do with the child. Mm. Very hard, that, to lose a parent. It was never going to be easy after her mum died, but he always did seem distracted with his fancy art project. Thank you. 
Tintin really wasn't for Val, was it? I spent the summer of 83 with Henry Outram, Laird of Shelmiston, in his grand hall working on a new piece. It was supposed to be about the volcano, but once I arrived, I found myself particularly taken by all the veils around the island. Henry was a delightful host, always excited to have us bright young artists around, and always ready with a charming question or a fortifying glass of something. His daughter, I think her name was Mallory or Valerie or something, was usually outside roaming the grounds. Henry said she was discovering herself and learning self-reliance through independent play. She seemed feral to me. One day, I came across the perfect finishing touch to my sculptural masterpiece, but it turned out to belong to the wretched child. I tried to explain to her why I needed it, but she snatched it away and walked off. I went to Henry, thinking he could make her give me the boat. But to my astonishment, Henry told me it was up to her if she wanted to give it to me. Henry called his daughter and we all talked about it. When Henry suggested that maybe I could buy the boat, her little eyes lit up. It cost me 200 pounds for that little wooden boat. But, well, it was worth it. Henry was a good dad at heart, caring about Val's feelings and treating her like a grown-up even when she was little. Partly how she became so independent, I reckon. I know it was tough on him, but they both turned out pretty well. I wonder how many people even saw this. Last summer, before our GCSEs, Val and me spent a lot of time together, usually wondering how we could get our hands on something to drink. No one on this stupid little island would serve us, though. One day, we were hanging around on the allotments near the quay when we spotted something. And so, later that night, We went into the woods behind Val's house to drink it, sitting on top of that ancient stone that they say protects the island. But there was no way we were going to get through it all, so we decided to bury the rest. A few weeks later, we went to dig it up again, but couldn't remember where we dug the hole. There is so much of our history buried on this island. Stories everywhere, right under your feet.
Wow, Morris, this smells incredible. The famous sculptor Vernon Russett was working on a huge statement piece in my honor. A statue of a camel with my head. When I saw it, I felt quite uncomfortable, but I didn't want to upset him. Poor Vernon could be awfully temperamental, sinking into dark moods for days. The week before the public unveiling, Vernon had me visit the statue. He needed to make some final adjustments to the face. Valerie came along too. She looked like thunder. She hated that statue and wasn't afraid to show it. I couldn't help thinking how like her mother she was. When the statue was revealed, the nose was missing. Fortunately, we all managed to cover our surprise and act like nothing was wrong. So no one was any the wiser. Some fellow from the Times wrote a glowing review so Vernon wasn't too glum about it. I'm pretty sure I know what happened to that nose. Aha, the old Outram spirit. <laughs> Good for you, Valerie. Your mother would have been proud of you. Val told me about this. She had a whole speech prepared in case they figured out it was her who cut that nose off. But she never even needed. This thing looks heavy. I'm surprised Val was able to even lift it. Oh, we did it! Oh, yes! I know what Val smells like now. Her signal is wafting through to me very clearly. Time to fly.
Morris? Morris Lopton? Is that really you? And Sparky? Val! Oh, it's so good to see you again. You too. You're looking very, um... Um, dead. (laughs) Yeah. But quite good, considering. Hello, Val. And Sparky talks now. Death certainly has been strange. What brings you by? Well, we're trying to find a replacement custodian. You've surely seen the volcano. Oh, yes. Poor Aggie. Must be very tired. Aggie? Aggie is the current custodian. Oh, well, then, yes. We were hoping you might replace Aggie. Oh, Morris. That's... that's some ask. Oh, you can do it, Val. I'm flattered, but those are enormous shoes to fill. And I'm not like you, Morris. I don't love this town like you do. And, if I'm being honest, I can't abide all those arty types and mainlanders tromping around. I can't speak for them. This job isn't for me. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that, Val. But uh, I understand. Thank you. It's been so nice to see you again. You too, Val. Um, Sparky, I'd love to spend some more time chatting with Val. Oh, I'm sorry, Morris. We really need to keep this search up. That volcano is looking dire. Come back later, Morris. I'll be here. Oh, well, all right, Val. I'll find you later. Goodbye. Slow down, Sparky. I need to get some things straight. No time, Morris. We need to find the next prospect. It's just that I don't quite understand what we're doing. We're looking for the custodian. Well, I get that bit, Sparky, but what does the custodian have to do exactly? Oh, well, um, it's hard to explain with your human words, but uh, the custodian kind of mingles with the island, becomes a part of it. A part of the rock, uh, the volcano? Yes, the rock, and the sea, and the animals, and plants. The custodian becomes a part of all of these things. It becomes part of the island spirit. And you give up being a ghost? Yeah, well, a walking around talking kind of ghost. Stop being someone who can go into the west. It's quite a sacrifice. Oh, wow. Well, no wonder Val doesn't want to fill those shoes. Aggie must be a legend. Well, she really is. I always thought there are those folks destined to be mayors and, I suppose, custodians. And then there are people like me and Val. They're destined for smaller lives. What? Small? Morris... Your heart is as big as the island. Everyone knows that. Yeah, I suppose I'm more like one of those island oddities in the museum. Yeah, and they were always the visitors' favourites. Now, we need to move on. Next up is Ogden Beckett, in the old town. Ogden it is. I'm right behind you, Sparky. So, Ogden next, eh? I'll be glad to see him again. Hmm. His music always hurt my ears, but he was good at tin scratches. Oh, <laughs> lovely guy. Oh, look, the ferry's coming in. There'll be loads of tourists all over this quayside soon. Well, I suppose they won't get in our way much anymore, eh, girl? <laughs>
I remember when a young Ogden asked to join the Shelmerston Silver Band. I recognised his talent immediately. He could play anything, that lad. Literally anything. Eventually he settled on the sousaphone, which he always insisted on playing with his lucky bronze mouthpiece. One evening after the silver band played a storming concert in the Camel, Ogden and Sally got it into their heads to go for a night swim in the harbour. Young love and all that. Ogden left his mouthpiece behind, and when we came back the next morning to pack up, it had disappeared. It really rattled him. Ogden was worried he wouldn't be able to perform without it, but of course, next time we played, he was just as good as ever. Didn't need any lucky mouthpiece, our Ogden. He could play anything, that lad. Ogden was so talented, a real virtuoso. <laughs> Oh, I loved listening to him play. Oh, speak for yourself, Morris. It was a terrible racket. but batting, hmm, not sure. Ogden showed up with his own bat. He told me he'd won it in a pub in Dunedin and that it had belonged to a famous New Zealand player. I wondered whether I should put him into bat at all, but Ogden whispered to me that he'd been playing on deck all the way home. I knew Ogden wasn't a bluffer, but he was never the guy who got picked for the first team at school. Still, I had nothing to lose. Ogden hit a six with his first stroke. We went wild! And just when I thought it must be a fluke, he hit another and another. He was a machine! Ogden hit so many cricket balls out into the sea that we had to stop play. We'd run out. It was a stunning win and we carried Ogden back across the sand and into the camel. Even though he'd won the match pretty much single-handedly, he insisted... How's that? 
<laughs> what a great day that was. <laughs> and we've beaten Appledore every year since. Those poor chaps never did recover from Ogden's incredible batting. <laughs> Morris, remember when we found one of these heavy balls on the beach and I dropped it on your toe? We were 14 when we started going out. Me and my friend Cassia had started a beach clean at the weekend, and Ogden turned up with his mate Godfrey. I had no idea Ogden liked me. He was the tallest in our year, and we all fancied him. By the time we reached the little cove at the north end of the beach, he'd asked me to come to a concert he was playing in. I said yes. He'd been going out for a few years, when I applied to Floristry College on the mainland. I didn't tell Ogden. I didn't believe I'd get in and didn't want him to think I was trying to get away from him. Ogden might have looked mature and confident, but he was a gentle soul, not nearly as sure of himself as he looked. But I did get in and he was gutted. I felt terrible. I didn't want to hurt Ogden. He said he didn't mind, but I could see he was covering. My last week on Shelmerston was really hard. Every time I saw him, it felt so strained, and I couldn't sleep. Finally, on my last night, I made a decision. I would take an apprenticeship at the garden centre on the island instead, so we could stay together. It felt like the right thing to do. I would tell Ogden in the morning. But when I opened the door the next day, I found Ogden's sousaphone left on the doorstep. I was terrified. What did it mean? What had he done? I ran down to his house, my heart in my mouth. His mum, she never did like me, was a little bit smug. She told me Ogden had sailed off to New Zealand. He was headed to Christchurch, she said, and didn't know when he was coming back. Then she shut the door. I was more than a bit tearful, but, you know, looking back, I think we both needed to have a bit of an adventure. We spent a lot of time with Sally during this period. We used to meet up quite often when she returned from Floristry College and I was working at the museum. For a while I thought maybe we would get together. But she always seemed a bit out of reach. Yeah, sort of distracted. Well, it makes sense now. was walking home from school, a bunch of us, and I told him my granddad said the lad had a live battery and camel living somewhere in the woods. Everyone laughed, but I told them it was true. Ogden didn't believe me. Someone would have seen it. He dared me to climb in and prove it. I told him he'd have to come with me. Sneaking past the big house, we were almost caught by the gamekeeper and had to run. Hell for leather for the woods. 
We reached the trees out of breath. I was bent double and leant against a tree. Ogden had better breath control and he recovered quickly. He saw it first. The clouds parted, the moon shone down, and Ogden gasped. And then I did too. Was it? It was. The next day we were kicking ourselves. We had no proof. No one was going to believe us. But we knew what we saw. Oh, yeah, he was a couple of years above these chaps at school. Oh, and he's right. No one believed them. We gave them so much stick. Camels are so obviously a made-up animal. Humans will believe any old rubbish. Get in there. I missed Ogden so much, and for the first month there was no letter at all. I took my place at college on the mainland without knowing how he was feeling. It was a shock how low it made me, even though I was working with flowers, my dream job. I threw myself into making friends and working as hard as I could. I wondered about him travelling the world without me and without his sousaphone. What he was doing, how he was feeling. Then the letters started arriving and it was amazing. Each one came with a penny from a different country. One from Valparaiso, another from Dakar. I wrote back and told Ogden about my course, trips to Kew Gardens, which were amazing. And Ogden told me about his voyage, watching dolphins and flying fish, crossing the equator. Sometimes we were both lonely. We poured out our hearts to each other. In a funny way, I think the letters made us closer than ever. When he arrived in Christchurch, He'd send me flowers pressed in his letters. I sent him a shell from home, 
and then he sent me a New Zealand halfpenny. It was my favourite. On one side was the head of a Maori tiki. Ogden told me it was lucky. I came back to the island, and when my father died, I opened up my own florist shop on the quay. I tucked the halfpenny under the front step for luck, polished up Ogden's sousaphone, and put it in the window. They both brought me luck, and the shop flourished. One day, Ogden showed up at the shop, completely out of the blue. He told me there was nowhere like Shelmerston, and no one like me. I was so thrilled to see him. I asked him to marry me there and then. He said yes. The lure of Shelmerston. It always pulls people back when they try to move away. They were a lovely couple, Sally and Ogden. One good thing about being dead, I'll never have to deal with counting change again. Ah, uh, yes, a very distinctive odor indeed. I reckon I can find him from this. Here I come, Ogden. to see you, Morris. Oh, it's great to see you too, mate. Have a stretch, Ogden. We have a question for you. Sparky! Owner of the very finest singing voice on the island. What can I do for you? Well, it's about the custodian. We need a replacement. Ah, yes. I've heard that volcano rumbling. Poor Aggie must be very tired. Yes, she is. We need a replacement. Oh. Oh, you want me to be the custodian? Well, I, I, I'm honored, but uh, I can't. Are you sure? The island is in dire need. I know, and I sympathize, but Sally is the other half of me. I need to watch over her. Everything else may be changing, but she's my constant, and I'm hers. I need to go into the West with her when it's her time. Yes, I... Yeah, I understand. You two always did have an enviable connection. Mm. We were very lucky to find each other. And I'm still lucky just... just to watch over her. Makes this place still feel a bit like home, even as it changes. So I'm going to stay. But listen, once you've found the custodian, Come back and enjoy a sniff of that beer in the camel with me, eh? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, sure, Hogton. Well, see you around.
well. After all these years, Ogden still carries that torch for Sally. I wish I'd been so lucky. Things I should have done. You were busy with the museum, Morris. And you did walks, and you did fetch, and belly rubs, and... <laughs> yeah, all right, all right, yes. I was very busy. Thank you for reminding me. You did plenty. But now you need to find the next custodian. Hey, how long has Aggie been custodian? Oh, a little while now. You've met her, actually. I have? Well, her body, anyway. In the museum. What? Her, her body? In, in, in the museum? Oh, wait! That's right, Morris. The bog lady. The bog lady of Shelmerston. But that's Aggie. Mm-hmm. Well, that's her body anyway. Her spirit is all around us, of course. But Aggie is Bronze Age. Uh, Three thousand years. She's been custodian all that time. Yep. Well, no wonder she's tired. More tired every minute. We need to get to the next prospect. Greg Litherland, at the campsite. Hmm, Greg. Okay. The one part of the island I never spent much time at. I never cared for camping. Although we did find a lot of Bronze Age goods down here. Really fascinating bits and bobs. I reckon this was an important place once, and not just to shell us. Oh, oh, there's so many great smells here. Oh, and so many rabbits to chase. Stop it, Sparky, you have a job to do. <laughs> you know, I suppose I do like it better up here now I don't have to worry about combing all those burrs out of your fur. At least this part of Shelmerston isn't changing too much. Yes. Now let's sniff out Greg. Yeah, I always found Greg a bit difficult. That business with the owl of his. Uh, he wasn't a bad guy at heart. Just liked animals a bit more than people sometimes. Maybe. But who can blame him? Let's find some people who remembered him. Dig a little deeper. Yeah, memories of Greg Leatherland. Here we come. I only knew Greg briefly from the summer that I took over the campsite and he retired. He seemed harmless enough, if a bit strange, living in that nasty little caravan. As part of his official handover process, he gave me a big box of rule books that I was apparently supposed to give every camper when they arrived. I couldn't believe them. The amount of inches apart each tent had to be. The angle of pitch permitted colours of guy ropes. No skipping ropes, marbles, conkers or throwing games. No singing with hand drums. I built a huge fire on the beach, invited the whole site for a big party and burned the lot. But then... Awkward. Greg showed up. I guess he'd been collecting some things from his caravan and came to see what the noise was all about. You could tell he wasn't comfortable, but he sat down and tried to make conversation. I told him how beautiful I thought Shelmerston was, and he started telling me all about the wildlife here and the best places to spot birds. He was actually quite a sweet guy. He must have noticed what we were burning, but he never mentioned it. That was the last time I saw him. I always felt a bit guilty. I mean, I got him wrong. He wasn't that bad. Well, that's a good thing she kept one of them. It must be around here somewhere.
What's this about dogs having to be on leads the whole time? Mm, outrageous. I've dreamed of seeing a Jemson sea owl. One day, I read the news that a guy on this little island called Shelmerson had discovered one. I had to see it. The only b, &B on the island booked up really fast, so I decided to stay at the temporary campsite set up by the guy who discovered the sea owl, Greg Litherland. The atmosphere was amazing. There were twitchers from all over the world come to see it. Greg had given the owl a name. David Abrahams. A bit weird, but I guess he was the one who found it. And because it had no mate, it was lonely, and he'd made a model female owl out of concrete. That was quite impressive. I got to know Greg a bit during my stay. He really seemed to resent all the noise and fuss on the island. His island, as he thought of it. And the irony was that he was the one who'd got everyone excited about coming to Shelmerston. Greg told us he'd take us up in groups to the owl's nest site, but I snuck up early with my camera. It saw me and it flew off hooting and I didn't get a picture. I was gutted. I had to make do with a picture of the model. It wasn't the same. Ah, I remember that. All those bird watchers suddenly arriving and nowhere for them to stay. I didn't think Greg had it in him to start a campsite, but he somehow pulled it together. David Abrahams. I love camping. We've come to Shelmerston every summer with the kids for years. Okay, our tent is a bit bright, but that means the kids can always see it. Greg seemed angry about everything this year. He told us our tent was outside of the regulation colours and being around the kids seemed to really upset him. But they were only being kids, just running around playing. Greg was blowing that bloody whistle every five minutes. One day, Greg confiscated my little one's kite. He was terrifying. We still sometimes get nightmares about it. I had to do something. When I saw Greg put the whistle down, I pinched it and took out the pee. You know, the thing that makes the noise. I threw that pee somewhere Greg would never find it. He should have seen his face when he blew his whistle and nothing happened. I always wondered how Greg managed to get so good at hand whistling.
Rabbit poo. It doesn't excite me the way it used to when I was alive. Miles and I came to Shelmerston for the Scheller Cup final. Miles was the world champion for ages. Greg, the campsite manager, was a huge Scheller fan. Always gave us the best pitch on the campsite. Miles was up early every morning training for the big race. Greg would always be lurking in the background taking photos. It became rather annoying. How many photos did he need? Oh God, and one time he turned up at our barbecue and wouldn't leave. The man could not take a hint. So race day arrives and Greg is there with his camera, of course, getting in everyone's way. So Greg leans out into the track as the pack came past, miles in the lead and Miles goes crashing right into Greg. Total disaster. Miles goes down and Quasi flies past him to win the race. Miles was absolutely gutted. He definitely would have won it. Later that night, all us shellers were on our way back from the pub and we heard Greg outside his caravan, just sat by himself crying. Miles, he was such a good sport, went over and spoke to him, invited him over to our camp for a drink. So then Greg came back and hung out with us, brought his camera and showed us all his Scheller race photos. You know, that guy was actually a pretty great photographer. By the end of the night, Miles had forgiven him. Miles was good like that. Shellers. I've never understood the appeal of that. Seems blooming uncomfortable to me. Poor old Greg. He was always rubbing people up the wrong way, but he meant well. And he really loved this place. we could use this. I am a very photogenic dog, you know. Hmm. 
My best thing is throwing discs. I am really good. I like playing with Dan and Toddler. It's our favourite thing when we go camping on Shelmerston. One time, Greg Lifflin came up the beach, all red faced like an angry tomato. He pointed at a sign. It said, No throwing games. He was yelling and shouting at us. He told me to give him my disc, but I wouldn't. I threw it high up into the air. And it went bang into a massive bird. Then the bird fell into the sea. I felt so awful. I never meant to hurt the bird. The whole thing was terrible. Mr. Liffelam was screaming. He waded into the sea, picked up that bird, and carried it back to the beach. He was crying and crying. I'm sorry, Mr. Liffelam. Oh, Greg. Poor guy. Oh, and that poor bird. I guess that explains why he was always so prickly. of our walks on the beach. Hmm. Hmm. Woof! Okay, I've got it.
Greg. Oh, hello. Morris, what are you doing here? Oh, hello there, pup. Hi, Greg. Hmm, you can talk now. Rather prefer my animals when they don't talk. <laughs> yeah, Greg, uh, we need to ask you, uh, would you be interested in being the next island custodian? It's a very important job. Oh, no, absolutely not. This is your mess, and you can sort it out. My mess? Well, how do you mean? You dug her up. I warned you and I warned you when we were still alive that those archaeological digs were a bad idea. And now we know exactly how bad. Well, now hold on, Greg. That's not how that works. Oh, isn't it, talking dog? 3,000 years, no eruptions. You dig Aggie up and then suddenly her grip on the island is weakening. Well, some coincidence that sounds like. Well, I, I didn't. I, I, I never did. No, 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 no. There's no way I'm doing that job. It's too much obligation. It's not my responsibility. And frankly, one lifetime of humans was plenty for me. Now, I'm going to stay right here until I can find David Abrams. Fine. Thanks, Greg. See ya. I suppose. Thanks, Greg. It's not looking good, is it, old girl? Don't worry, Morris. I hate it when you worry. It makes me nervous. He's waiting for David Abrams. I guess I'm like him in that way. The most important person in my life wasn't technically a person. More like an island. Yes, the island. This island. A whole island's worth of people and stories. Not like Greg at all. Everyone loves you. Really? Well, loved me, perhaps, past tense. No, they still do. And there's one more person who loves you we need to talk to. Our last prospect. I just know we're getting close now. Hey, Sparky. How do you know all this stuff? I mean, you're just my dog, aren't you? Well, nobody is just anything, Morris. I'm mostly the dog you raised, but I'm also kind of a messenger, a scout, part of something bigger. Aggie sent me to help guide you. Aggie sent you? No time to explain, Morris. We have to get to the last prospect. Well, however it came to be, I'm glad I get to spend more time with you, old friend. So am I, Morris. Now, off to see Samfire down at the harbour. Ah, Sam. Yeah, lead the way, girl. Ah, the harbour. I always loved watching the boats come in and out. <laughs> Never did get around to expand in the fishing exhibit, did I? <laughs> you remember coming down here with me? Well, I'd have liked it better if you'd have let me swim. I love your confidence, Sparky. But you always thought yourself a bigger dog than you actually were. Oh, lots more boats than there used to be, though, weren't there? Certainly are. Shelmerston got busy. Oh, this is busier than even I remember. Say, how long have we been doing this search? Oh, I don't know, Morris. Once you're dead, time seems to be a bit less important. Does it? Oh, I don't know. I suppose it seems a bit galling that time and everything else keeps moving, even though I've stopped. Makes a man feel... unimportant. Oh, you're not unimportant, Morris. You're saving the island. And to do that, we better go find some people who remember Samfire. Yes. Yes. Yes, Sam surely understands the feeling of watching everything change. Fish folk live for, what, 200 years? That's no small amount of change. Not volcano change, though, Morris. And that's what we need to avoid. Off we go!
By the time Sam started as the Arbor Controller in 79, the fishing industry in Shelmiston was on its arse. No way to compete with those factory trawlers from the mainland, was there? Couldn't moor those things anywhere near the island, even if we had them. Of course we were all smuggling, stands to reason, done it? There was no money, all those old fishing sheds on the quay, the ones the tourists like, were falling down. The old place looked, pardon me, like a tip. There was a lot of trouble at first. Sam trying to stick by the rules and catch us out any way they could, and us trying any which way to give her the runabout. It wasn't easy, mind you. She was smart, that Sam. You never knew when they were going to pop her head out of the water beside your tub. And to be fair to Sam, some of them smuggling boys were bad and worse stuff than booze on some of them boats, and that's the truth. Probably no bad thing, Sam put a stop to it. But in time, Sam started to see how things were, how we do things, and we came to an understanding of sorts. If Sam turned a blind eye to a bit of the decent stuff, the armless stuff, then we'd report the worst of it. I mean, we all want to keep the sea safe, stands to reason. Plus, Sam was partial to a bottle or two of the sheep shank on occasion. Oh, yeah. Sam was sharp as a gutting knife. They made us hand over some of the, uh, shall we say, dividends to fix up the key. All them sheds and that. Make them into something we can be proud of. Turn things around for Shelmiston, that did. Now we get more of those tourists since the big ferry started. And they love a day out on a boat. Can takes them all out, he does. And at the same time, Sam organised a kind of work-sharing thing with the fish folk. Got some of them to swim along with the fishing boats. Help them locate the biggest shoals. Gave those big trawlers with all their fancy radar gear a run for their money. <laughs> we'll never be big players in the fishing down here. But thanks to Sam, we hold our own. Bless them. I reckon I still have a bottle or two of sheep shank stashed away at the museum. Don't suppose anyone will ever drink them now. A different kind of spirit to the ones we've been looking for. I'm getting the scent of Grenkins again, Morris. I swim with a pod south of the Fire Isles. I believe the dry siders call the larger one Shelmiston. <gasps> it's where the ceremony happens for the dry sider who stopped the world from cracking. That's where I first heard talk of toast and where I met the friend called Samfire. I did not believe it at first. A food which snaps so dry. <laughs> then one morning at sunup, I followed the ship and caught a blackened slice as it arced into the water. This was the start of my lifelong love of toast. <laughs> I saw Samphire on the dry side and came up out of the sea to ask them for toast. <laughs> they asked me to put on some pants. But I refuse to denigrate myself with dry side fabric. No matter, I had brought some shiny coins with me that I found on the seabed and secreted in my swimming falls. Sam took me to their parents' toe shack, but they refused to serve me without clothes. They also told me that my shiny coins were unsuitable, too old. So Sam lent me some trousers and I swept the toe shack in return for crispy slices. 
Sam taught me some of the ways of the dry ciders, but to be honest, I'm only interested in the toast. I never wanted to eat anything else. Sam understood this. I spend my nights swimming through the black waters of the deepest ocean trenches. By day, I come up onto Quayside and fill up on the finest crusted seedy bloomer, almost black, no butter. Oh, I could really go for a nice piece of toast right now. But, uh, yeah, with butter. It's a shame, but it doesn't seem like there's a whole lot of toast on it. When I was a kid, I hated the annual Morlo call. I always kept away and found excuses not to be there. Then, age 10, my dad marched me down to the beach with other men and put a knife in my hand. It was the worst day of my life. I saw Morlo slip from jaw to belly, more blood than you could imagine. I didn't sleep for months after. But you grow up, don't you? I never felt it right that we was killing Morlows, but what could I do about it? I was just a fisherman. One day I see Sam Fire, the new harbour officer, handing out leaflets on the quayside. Stop that, Col. I went along to that first meeting at the campsite. Greg Litherland was one of the other organisers. It was beautiful. So much hope around that campfire. When I spoke about the pain of the Morlo, it really felt like the young'uns were listening. Me, Sam and Greg held regular events to raise funds for badges and patches. I was proud to wear mine on me best Gansey. There was quite a rift between us and the old guard. They felt the ban was an attack on our ways. Sam and me took a load of the fishermen out for a beer and Sam made them listen. They really respected Sam. We got most of them on our side that way. By 87, we finally felt like we had enough support to push for change. So the week before the Morlo showed up, we organised a mass dying on the beach. There were loads of us lying down on that sand. Islanders, fishermen, fish folk all together. 
and the press showed up and the mainland TV and for the first time in 500 years we stopped that cull. I'm so glad we don't do that cull anymore. I was proud of Sam and that lot when they finally made the olden see sense. And well, I did my part. Held a lot of those early meetings at the museum we did. Morlows, such gentle creatures. It was the sixth summer after I spawned that I went to my first Aggie's Day ceremony. You know, Aggie, the dry cider who saved the world from cracking in two. We don't go on land until we're six years old. It's all swimming, wafting around. Standing up is hard at first, the weight distribution. Anyway, I, I went up dry side for the ceremony, and that was where I first met Sam. It was so loud and hot out there, all that shell blowing. I was bored and my body felt dry and heavy. I was too young, really. There were souvenir stalls selling bracelets with little stones of polished lava. I wanted one so bad I would not shut up about it. Sam saw I was fed up. They took me up the beach, away to the dunes, and Sam gave me a little polished stone of my own to play with. <laughs> Had a heart of gold, they did. It wasn't until years later that I found out it was a tiny replica of the one Aggie died on. We became good friends. Sam helped a lot. They were always on my side. My pod, we were quite traditional, didn't like us working with the dry ciders, but Sam talked me into going for the job as a diver on the new harbour. If it wasn't for them, I don't think I'd have tried. That stone was my lucky charm. I took it with me when I went for the interview, and I took it down with me when I went on my first dive. I had a pocket made specially in my tool belt. Sam took me under their fin, invited me out to the camel and let me stay with them and blithe on the ferry if it was a late one. And there were plenty of late ones. Karaoke nights are still my favourites. Every time I feel that lucky stone in my pocket, I think of Sam. I remember all the fish folk coming up on the beach for Aggie's Day when I was a lad. Seems less of a big deal these days. I guess they still celebrate it, but, well, it's a lot more sedate. Back then, oh, it was a huge event.
It was the sixth summer after I... It was the sixth summer after. Oh, magic stones. I knew humans were superstitious, but I thought the fish folk would be a bit more savvy. I first met Sam when I sailed the new ferry, the Queen of the Isles, into harbor. Of course I'd heard of the fish folk, but I'd never met one. Sam was an amazing pilot, knew the waters better than any boatman. It was strange steering a course for someone actually in the water, but we never went wrong with Sam to guide us in. Next time I was in Chelmerston, we went for a drink at the Camel. I'm more into bats than beer, but Sam was intriguing, and the atmosphere in there was great. Like a warm nest. Great band, too. Awesome sousaphone player. I think we got on because we were both a little bit on the outside of things. Sam invited me over for toast and hot chocolate. Honestly, hot chocolate doesn't do it for me. But the toast... That multi seed bread. Sam made the best toast. I told Sam that next to a good cuttlefish bone, that it was my favorite snack. I stayed over. In the morning, we went for a walk along the beach. And just as the sun was rising, I took them flying on my back. We went up and looked down over the island. Sam wasn't scared at all. They said it was like swimming through the air. It was on the next trip to Shelmerston. We just sighted land when Sam's head popped out of the water right beside my berth and passed me a fresh cuttlefish bone. 
carved especially for me. When we moved in together, it was the best day of my whole life. I put that cuttlefish bone on my bedside table within big reach. I still look at it every day, every single day. I just remembered that time Blythe and I did a duet at the karaoke. <laughs> I can't believe I agreed to it. <sighs> Must have had a few too many. Ah, I never knew how Sam and Blythe met. I used to love finding these on the beach. Fire. Morris and Sparky! Oh, lovely to see you both. What can I do for you two? Well, we, we wanted to ask you something. Um, it's about Aggie. Mm. She doesn't have long left now, does she? Poor thing. No, not long at all. We were hoping you might replace her as custodian. Oh, Morris. I spent years of my life as harbour master trying to keep people from meddling with nature. I don't feel any differently now. I'm appreciative of all Aggie has sacrificed for us, but the island spirit isn't evil. It just needs to erupt from time to time. And if it needs to now, let it, I say. Let nature do what it must. As the fish folk say, the tides will tell. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. Yeah, Sam, I hear that. I really do. No! No, Morris. We can't just give up. Now, we'll talk about this in a bit, Sparky. Sam, it's always good to see you. Uh, will you be around later? I think I will. A volcanic eruption is a rare and beautiful thing. I think I'd like to see it. Okay, we just need to talk to Aggie. She'll know what to do. No, Sparky. I've been thinking about it, and I think Samfire's right. I think it's maybe time to let the town go. No, Morris. It's not. No, it's all right, Sparky girl. It's over. This isn't my town anymore. The only ones around here who remember me are ghosts. That's not true. No, it is. But that's all right. Truly it is. Everything for a season and all that. And I miss the people I knew. The people who've moved on. I want to see them again. I think I will take Pete Nochop on his offer and head into the West with him. Shelmerston doesn't need Morris Lupton any longer. Morris Lupton, you will not give up. You have been granted a precious responsibility and you will honor it. Sparky? I'm... sorry about that. Remember when I told you I was mostly Sparky? I am, but... mostly. Then what else are you? I am the rock that you stand on. The wood you people built this town from. The magma bubbling beneath your feet. I am Selmiston. And right now, I want to erupt. But I have also made connections to the things that live here. Connections I want to keep alive. I need you, Morris. Right. Well, uh... And I'm still your Sparky. And I need you, Morris. We all do. Oh, Sparky. I know you feel forgotten. I know you want to move on. I do too, but... But I can't until I wrap up this last bit of unfinished business. Will you... Will you try one last avenue with me? If we still can't find a solution, then... Then I'll be done. It'll all be done. And we can go into the West together. Please. All right, Sparky. One last try. But who else is there to talk to? Aggie. Aggie? But where is she? Oh, she's everywhere, isn't she? She is. But I can sniff her out. I just need some mementos. But, but where would we find mementos from back then? Back to your museum, Morris. Ah, well, it's reopened. <laughs> well, I suppose that's good. You need to keep up the footfall. Everything has to move on. Well, yes, but, you know, it is still your museum, Morris. It wouldn't be here without you. Ah, it was never my museum, Sparky. It was Shelmerston's. It's changing, but... You know, I think it should. So, what happens now? How do we find 4,000-year-old memories? Ah. Come with me, Morris. There's one more thing I ought to show you. Uh, oh, okay, Sparky.
Well, don't suppose I'll ever look at Aggie's room the same way again, will I? Morris, take a look at those skulls, please. The skulls? But they have memories inside them? Well, that's rather morbid, Sparky. Not quite. Look, I didn't explain this before because I felt things were confusing enough, but... That slicing is a bit more powerful than I've led you to believe. Oh, well, what do you mean? Well, we aren't limited to memories of people who are alive. People are bounded by time, but memories aren't. Check it out. Oh, I didn't think dead stomachs could get queasy, but here we are. Where are we, Sparky? When are we, Morris? This is Shelmiston in Aggie's time. You should be able to find some memories of her here. <laughs> you are some dog, Sparky. <laughs> It was the worst night in the world when Aggie was born. It began in the old village, the one swept away by the rivers of fire. The ground shook and the earth split open and spat sparks. The sun hid and the huts burst into flame as we fled. I thought we would all die. Everyone washed in the burning orange death and Aggie's mother howling with the pain of the child coming. as far as the cliff top by the sea. The mountain was still roaring and roaring. The rock ran in rivers toward the sea. The air smelled of death and poison. But Aggie was perfect. Small and angry, her tiny fists pummeling the air. I used my knife to cut the cord. We chose a spot for the new village closer to the beach. The burning rivers cooled to pumice and black glass. I made sure everyone knew that a life that began in this way would be special. Not everyone believed me, but Aggie proved me right. My goodness, giving birth like that must have been awful. What a terrifying situation. Hmm. So, where do you think that knife is? Should we look around here, or...? No, I I'm pretty sure I've seen that knife before. Back at the museum, I reckon. Okay, Morris. Let's go.
to think that people had not long stopped using flint tools when this was made. There is so much history in this knife. Ooh. I'd love to see what else it got up to. I'm getting the scent of... Of course we watched her. We had heard of her birth and seen her on the shore. Her feet sometimes in the seawater, her body in the sun. We did not show ourselves at first. As a test, we left the mirror on the black shore, born of the volcano on the same day as her, and waited to see what would happen, to see if it called to her. She picked it up, turned it from side to side. She took it home. The next time I saw her, I introduced myself. We sang together and I showed her how the mirror worked, how if you emptied your mind and thought of air and light and sea, you would see things in its surface, how things would unfurl in the future. Aggie was better at mirror gazing than any of us sea folk. She saw a girl, her own daughter not yet born, as leader of the dry folk. I told Aggie to keep on gazing into that mirror, that one day the island would need something more than a leader. Oh, I had a box of rocks that looked like that mirror somewhere. Powerful, Morris. Can you feel it? always fearless. My mother Aggie told me there was nothing I couldn't do. With Otsul and without, I hunted the deer in the woods and the hares on the mountain, all before I had taken my first lover. And younger still, one time Aggie had me knock her tooth out when she was in terrible pain. I didn't mind even when the blood poured out. It was easy for me. Spears and knives were my nature. Death and courage were my meat and drink. I knew about Aggie's mirror, of course, but did not believe all of it. When Aggie warned us the Mauler was sick and there would be fewer calves for the following years, none of us listened. It was to be my first cull. I wanted their blood. It was my nature. We would not take less of the Mauler just because an old woman told us to. She came to the beach after the Morlo slaughter, her hair wild, eyes burning with fury. 
raged and shouted like a woman out of her mind. We had killed too many, she said. Then she left the village, told us she was done with all of us forever. As Otsul marked me with oil and blood, I did not mourn my mother leaving. I was young and foolish, and the sight of her ashamed me. But of course, I did not see what was to come. To think that they were still having the same arguments about the Moro way back in the Bronze Age. Aggie must have sensed the trouble ahead. Maybe she was trying to find a way to prevent it. What a beautiful object. Delighted to have it in our museum. She was alone, and I would bring her food sometimes, some fire and sea urchins. She would make dry food and we would eat it together. Textures unlike any we knew that broke apart in your hands and in your mouth. We would sing together, make tea together. We became her family. The dry folk left her alone. She had a companion for a few seasons, a hind who came down from the mountain and slept at her fire. And then, for a few more, a golden hare that ate from her hand. One night, we all felt it. Those of us in the water and those above. The island waking, rumbling, alive again, more furious than before. I found Aggie awake, tending her fire, unsleeping, unresting, staring into her mirror. She told me she'd seen the island sinking into orange fire and boiling sea, lost forever above and below. The village and our town in the sea caves, all gone. Aggie went to the shore and blew the sinistral shell, calling our people up from the water. Aggie sang for them, the oldest song, and we spoke for some time. That night, the sea and sky was all the same color, a deep gray blue like a mackerel's back without the glitter. As the dawn approached, Aggie left the beach to return to her people, to tell them what must be done. I... I'm not sure I want to see what happens next. We have to, Morris. a small thing, but it changed the entire course of our island.
We heard the shell and knew Aggie had returned. Ibni was the leader then. It had taken many seasons, more than we would have liked, but there were finally enough Morlo again and our village was growing. We were strong. Some of the younger ones didn't know Aggie and didn't want to hear her, called her a moon shot and crone, but Ibni looked in her mother's face and saw the truth of it. The end would come. The earth was growling again. There would be hot rivers of death and clouds of poison. But Aggie brought us the answer. She would give herself to the island. Ibni's voice shook. Surely a deer or a goat would be enough. The year's finest blackest calf. Aggie cast down her eyes and shook her head. We all knew. I offered my blade but Aggie turned me away. She took her knife that had cut her own cord the night the volcano last erupted and wrapped Ibni's fingers tight around the bone hilt. It must be you, Ibni, she said, and it must be now before the sun comes up. This day, this morning, or we are all gone, the village, the people, the island. Aggie embraced her daughter. Ibni whispered something, but I could not catch the words. Both women's faces shone with tears. Aggie sat on the ceremonial stone, the tears streaming now from all of us. Aggie delivered her final message. She told us her body must not be burned or given to the sea, but lain in the earth of the island beneath the mountain. Ibni was shaking, and then I realized it was not just Ibni. The whole island was trembling under our feet, waking up. Aggie told Ibni to be quick, the end was coming. As Aggie took Ibni's hand and guided the knife to her side, we saw the fish folk rising from the sea, hundreds of them, so many. I had no idea there were so many. Aggie was quiet the whole time, but Ibni cried out. A sound of longing and hurting from her heart like I had never heard. Then she fell silent, and as Aggie's life poured from her body, the island and everything on it fell suddenly still. Utterly still. We wept then, in sorrow and relief. Then the fish folk were among us, countless, numberless. One embraced Ibni, holding her up as it seemed her own legs might give way. When the sun came up that day, land and sea folk stood together for the first time, talking and singing the old songs, Aggie's songs, together. Ibni and the fish folk took Aggie up onto the mountain. They laid her in the peat alongside the knife and all the things she would need on her journey Ibni watched over Aggie for days afterwards. Before she was covered, she placed a sacred carved stone, Aggie's beloved hair, inside her mother's mouth to guide her and help her keep the mountain still forever. And so it was. Oh, Aggie. Now that's bravery. Sparky, it feels a bit... 
a disrespectful looking inside Aggie's body like that. You were the one who dug her up and put her on a plinth, Morris. Yeah, but, but, yeah, but I... But I uh... <laughs> Relax, Morris. This body isn't Aggie anymore. She's long past needing this old thing. Hmm. Well, all right then. Okay, Morris. I'll level with you. We absolutely didn't need to find Aggie's mementos in order for me to sniff her out. She's here, waiting for you. She has been this whole time. But then, wh why did we need to visit the Bronze Age? Aggie thought it was important for you to see those memories, so you would understand her past before you met her. But also, wasn't it cool? <laughs> that it was. The things I've seen now. Oh, Sparky, thank you so much. To think, for a while there, I was worried that being dead was going to be boring. You are very welcome, Morris. Okay, so, shall we go say hello to Aggie? Yes! Morris! Sparky! It's so good to see you both. Hey, Aggie. You, uh, wait, you, you know me? Of course I do. Morris Lupton, one of the best loved men in the history of Shelmerston. With the very finest dog. Uh, me? Oh, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> Come now. Let's go out of this place. Into the air. The one part of Shelmerston that looks just the same as the first day I saw it. I suppose it always will. Oh, I love this beach. It's always been my favourite beach. I'm going to go run. Aggie, look at Sparky. She's shining. Mm. That's the hope and the joy shining out of her. That's it, isn't it? The, the, the point of all of this. It is hope. Home. This island. It chose the two of you just as it chose me. And where will you be heading now? Heaven or, or something? Heaven? What's that? Well, I don't quite know how to explain it. But to me, it would be an awful lot like this beach. I don't know where I'm going, but I'm hoping to see Ivni, my daughter. It's been a very long time, but I remember her. We never forget the ones we love, do we, Morris? No, I don't suppose we do. I think she wants something, Morris. Huh. Would you look at that? <laughs> I just found a tennis ball in my pocket. <laughs> Here you are, girl. 